Welcome to Take Care. This is the podcast that helps you understand the background and habits of change makers. Host Rish Sharma and his guests give you the wisdom to help you learn a little more and get a bit better every episode. Hey everyone, welcome to Take Care. Today's guest is Professor Gregory Weiss, the founder of the Weiss Lab at UCI, and also the co-founder of Phage Tech and Debut Biotechnology. Oh, the other thing I should probably tell you is that they're doing some... Hey everyone, welcome to Take Care. Today's guest is Gregory Weiss, the professor at, at UCI, and also the CEO of Phage Tech and Dubai, uh, and Dubai. Biotechnology. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, Rish, but yeah. welcome, Greg. Really excited to have you here. Likewise, thrilled to be on. So, thank. I just wanted to start the audience, get them a little bit acquainted of your journey and uh, who you are. So, if you could just give them a background, kind of what led you to go into the field of research and help to co-found these companies as well. So. Well, th- thanks first, Rich. Thanks again for inviting me to chat about my favorite topic, which is starting companies and talking about change in the world. Mm-hmm. So I got started here in California working as a student in public schools, and I've been extraordinarily lucky to have lived in California most of my life. But as a little kid, I wanted to dig up dinosaur bones, and I noticed you're wearing a dinosaur uh, shirt today. Yes, yeah, serendipity right there. Yeah. Yes. I love digging in dirt and I love thinking about dinosaur bones. And I think dinosaurs are a great entry for any scientist. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I dreamt about being a a paleontologist. I told everyone for probably the first 10 years of my life that I'd be a paleontologist. And when I got to Berkeley as an undergraduate, I was probably heading to medical school. About that point, I got the medicine bug and the dream of helping cure people and take care of their ills was really fascinating to me. But as I started to explore that more, I also realized that I'm a slight germaphobe. I really don't like sick people all that much. Mm -hmm. And I am not the person who goes running over to take care of them. So fortunately, around that time, I was taking this organic chemistry class. And it was Mm mind-blowing because what I was learning was how the electrons work that make life possible. So why do molecules react with each other? Why Mm -hmm. do they do the things they do? And organic chemistry lets us answer those questions. So I uh, very quickly dropped the medicine side of things, went full on into the organic chemistry side of things, was uh, very fortunate to work with some amazing people at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I went to Harvard to be a graduate student where I worked for another really amazing individual. And I also uh, met some of my best friends on the planet there, mm-hmm. including my wife, who I met in the, in the laboratory at Harvard. Then I did a postdoc at Genentech, a biotech company. Mm-hmm. I wanted to learn this new technique, and the world's expert was at Genentech, so I felt very fortunate to work with him. And about six months into my postdoc, he suddenly left to start a small biotech company. Yep. And I realized that really I wanted at that. And so at that point, I was facing one of those major challenges, one of those big career challenges. Do I go and start this company with my advisor or do I stick it out at Genentech and continue on the academic path, publishing lots of papers? Mm -hmm. So suffice it to say, I stuck out with the academic path. And the reason is I just love teaching. I love Mm -hmm. standing in front of a classroom. I love talking to people like yourself. I love talking in general about thinking about uh, how the world works. So anyway, I stuck with the academic path, published uh, about 10 papers in two and a half years and then got a job at UCI in 2000, where I've been ever since. That's, thank you for giving that overview. What was it about both organic chemistry and finding out the, how the electrons work, and then how did that one singular thing like, make you, propel you to 
to, to one just do a Dallas career, what was the exact thing that you learned if you if you remember that? Sure, sure. I think it started to answer this really deep seated question that all of us humans grapple with, which is what is life? How, how does this stuff work? Why are we living? Why do the molecules and the reactions that make life possible, why do those exist? Why do they actually start? How do they do the things they do? Yeah. Right? What, what's causes Richard Feynman called it the wiggle and the jiggle of yeah. life. How, do, how does that absolutely happen? So that's what motivated me. And organic chemistry suddenly gave me some answers to those questions mm -hmm. in a really fundamental way. It was suddenly reducing those really philosophical questions down to, okay, Here's the chemistry, here's the physics that underlies them, and here's a foundation that you can use to start to maybe not answer what is life, but at least yeah. you can start to define it in mm -hmm. terms of physics and chemistry and really tackle the biology in a unique way. Oh, and by the way, organic chemistry also gives you a tool to go in and start making changes and mm -hmm. curing diseases and developing diagnostic devices and things like that, things that make the world a better place. So yep. that also addressed my need to, to, to heal people and to help people out of their life's crises. So that really uh, excited me. So That's I think fun. organic chemistry is just a, 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 a playground, really, for yeah. answering a whole bunch of challenging questions and then at the same time remaking our world into a better place, which is my dream. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So just curious to see, since we're in the current times of COVID crisis right now, if you could just kind of maybe see, talk about a little bit how the efforts at UCI and the overall the, the community at large is working towards uh, solving, solving this crisis right now. Right. This is a very challenging time, Rish. And I think I'm not alone in, you know, bemoaning our fates. This is a, a very bad virus that's been let out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's going to be with us for a while. So. At first, like everyone, I hunkered down in my house and, you know, comforted myself with a, a big stash of hot sauce and toilet paper mm -hmm. and, you know, hoped that uh, this thing would uh, be short. But what I realized after about a week of that was, you know, we're going to be stuck with this thing and it's circulating in the, in the population at such a rate that it's going to be very, very hard to track down and eliminate mm -hmm. and just allow it to die out. So... Fortunately, around then, the Dean of Physical Sciences, I'm in the School of Physical Sciences, mm -hmm. uh, James Bullock is the Dean, said that we can reopen our labs if we work on COVID-19 related research. So mm -hmm. my laboratory, together with a bunch of others in School of Physical Sciences, started to focus on what can we do to make a difference, to mm -hmm. try to improve our situation and, and harness the considerable power of chemistry and chemical biology and, and physics to do that. So. My lab is focused on diagnostics. Other labs are focused on therapies. Mm -hmm. And other labs are focused on really basic questions, like how does this thing end up taking over the immune response? How does it end up interacting with the immune response? Those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a really big effort on campus. Mm -hmm. And that the effort is focused on treatments, antivirals. What is the solution that you guys are looking to find? So my lab is focused on diagnostics. Mm -hmm. I want to understand and map antibodies that are responsible for neutralization and then develop diagnostics together with my collaborator, Reg Penner, mm -hmm. that could very rapidly tell us if you have them or you don't have those neutralizing antibodies. Got it. That would be incredibly valuable. And then other laboratories, as I indicated, are, are focused on therapeutics. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, do want, I uh, don't want to slight the important efforts of laboratories that are focused on the really fundamental questions. How does this virus in, infiltrate the, the body? And mm -hmm. then once it's there, why does it cause all these processes, inflammation, yeah. et cetera, to run amok? How does that work? How is this yeah. virus so much more harmful than other SARS viruses? And we're very fortunate at UCI to have some of the world's leading experts on mm -hmm. uh, coronaviruses and then also viruses in general. UCI mm -hmm. is one of the, probably one of the top, I would say 20 places in the country for virus research. We have a center wow. for viral research at UCI and they're outstanding, they're really mm -hmm. good. So their labs are, are reopened. The School of Biological Sciences is recertifying a level three, biosafety level three uh, facility mm -hmm. that will allow us to do tissue culture 
and to do model systems of this virus in a really powerful way. So those are all really exciting developments that are taking place. Yeah, it's great that it's a full comprehensive approach towards this. So just taking that into mind, and since you guys are in so steeped into the research, you know, the media is always, you know, providing updates on things. What should the audience look at when the media is talking about potential therapeutics or taste or, or detections in, in the virus? What, what are the important things to keep in mind as they're processing that information? Okay, that's a fantastic question. And it's a little hard to answer, but I think the answer is general to evaluating almost any science that's in front of you. Yeah. So first, has it been peer reviewed? Mm -hmm. If it's been peer reviewed, is it appearing in a journal that has rigorous peer review? Yep. And then second, what is the power of a study? Are we mm -hmm. talking about a handful of cases? Or are we talking about a thousand cases? Mm -hmm. And I think we saw some illustration of that today. There is in the news, there yep. were two studies about remdesivir, yes. the Gilead anti potential antiviral. And one study was low power, and mm -hmm. there was one study that was high power. And high power means more patients, better statistics, better mm -hmm. robustness. Those, those are type of things to evaluate. Mm -hmm. But this is a really tough time because uh, practically every day in the news, there are reports that aren't peer reviewed, right? Yeah. You'll hear about some new antibody test or, yeah. you know, there's a breakthrough in this. I would say it's worth, it's worth um, re learning about those and it's worth getting mm -hmm. excited about them because... Vish, I think all of us could use a little excitement in our lives right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, uh, treat them skeptically with a grain of salt and think about them in terms of being updates mm -hmm. in a long fight. And uh, we'll know that we're really making progress and, and your uh, listeners will know that we're making progress when they start seeing stuff coming out that's appearing in really solid journals mm -hmm. that is catching uh, the attention of the top scientists in the country. I think when, say, Anthony Fauci is getting excited about it, that's yeah. a good sign, right? When the National Academy of Sciences president is starting to talk about something, that's a really good sign. Mm -hmm. That's telling you that this is actually really robust stuff. And then mm -hmm. everything else, I hate to say it, is basically in the noise. It's kind of mm -hmm. in, the, 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 um, in the baseline. It's yeah. not going to be something that's going to move the needle. So we really need high quality science being done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that down. I think there'll be a lot of value to the audience just deciphering this whole situation. Especially so much people, so I think find people, probably their news diet is much higher than normal. So, yeah. so. <laughs> well, you know, what's really great is uh, people are looking at some really complicated data. Right? Yeah. I have friends who would not, you know, who don't even do their taxes. They're definitely not uh, numbers people, but every day they're checking uh, the OC uh, coronavirus site, you yeah. know, checking out what the OC Board of Health is saying about numbers of cases. And they're mm -hmm. following this and looking very carefully at trends and yeah. looking at things like semi-log plots and talking knowledgeably about them. Yeah. I think that's uh, been a really useful aspect of this is that all of us as news consumers have got a more sophisticated and that can only be for the better. Yeah, I think it's been a real reinvestment into science generally, and which has, I think, declined over the last several years in terms of people's interest in it. And now I think it's re that's one of the, I guess, bright, line, bright signs of this whole thing is just that reinvestment of knowledge in, in science. I hope you're right, Rish, because that is the, pr the, the lack of respect for science and uh, for policy being, being directed by science and being guided by science has been the the source of our problem with this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And it is also the source of many uh, future damaging problems, ranging from climate change to environmental destruction yep. to a bunch of other things where the science is very, very clear. It's uh, been looked at in great detail by a number of a large number of different techniques, mm -hmm. yet we've been unable to make any progress communicating that successfully to policymakers and also mm -hmm. to voters. Yeah. And so I, th I hope you're right. I hope there's yeah. a silver lining is that we'll return to our respect for what do the facts say? What yeah. does it actually say? Not just what does my gut say, but what are the facts? Yeah. What actually is there? What is real? What can I, if I make a bet on this, will it pay off, right? What is yeah. the actual uh, data that's telling me? And if I make this change, how will the data change? That would be incredibly valuable. Yeah, no, I, I'm all for 
right, so just take it back to a, I guess, a pre-COVID circumstance. What is, what is Vice Lab, and what do you guys focus on currently at UCI? Okay, so I am extraordinarily lucky. I, I can't tell you how uh, um, amazing my life has been, Rish, but I get to work with some of the smartest people on the planet. And I think when I was at Genentech, I, I alluded to this earlier, when I was thinking about, do I want to go to academics? Do I want to stay at, at biotech? What I realized was if I stay in biotech, I'll always be working for someone smarter than me. Mm -hmm. But if I go to academia, I'm going to have a lab full of people that are smarter than me. Yeah. And so uh, that's what I've always had at UCI. We, we track some of the world's best people, the very best scientists, and people who go on to amazing uh, careers. Anyway, so our lab is very broad. We um, have things like clinical experiments that are running where we're doing testing for bladder cancer diagnostic in collaboration mm -hmm. with physicians at UCI Medical Center. Mm -hmm. We have other uh, projects that are really fundamental, biophysics, how do molecules work? How do mm -hmm. enzymes catalyze chemical transformations? And mm -hmm. we collaborate with physicists at UCI to answer those questions. And then we have projects that are right at the interface with engineering, where we're collaborating with a bioengineer to address, can we develop smart drug delivery systems? Systems mm -hmm. that work like organs in the sense that they sense their surroundings and then dynamically respond and tweak the conditions and the dosages in mm -hmm. constant response to what's happening with the patient's body. And then we have uh, basic organic chemistry. I mm -hmm. wanna make bonds and I wanna make them better. Mm -hmm. I wanna do this because that will give us better ways of making therapeutics to treat diseases more effectively. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, the Weiss lab is centered around cancer and yeah. anti-cancer research and cancer diagnostics. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, these days we're 100% all about COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. But in the past, I was very focused on cancer because it's one of those major personal motivations that made me into scientists. Mm -hmm. So you say when you say it's a personal motivation, is there somebody in your family or somewhere that has Unfortunately, been Unfortunately, yes, Reese. My father died of uh, lung cancer. It's going on 20 years now. And this amazes me because he was a physician, incredibly hardworking man. So busy though that he didn't really take care of his, his own body and his own life. Mm -hmm. And by the time it was diagnosed, it was really too late in a lung cancer, at least. Sorry in, to hear in that. Years ago. Thanks. Um, but what I realized was, my goodness, our diagnostics are really primitive. Right, they're going to do this uh, chest scan, uh, X-ray of of him to diagnose this thing, and in order to see it on the X-ray, it had to be you know two and a half centimeters or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or uh, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer; she's fine now, fortunately. Mm -hmm. That's but great you, know, you have to wait until it's a lump that you can feel. Again, two and a half centimeters. Mm -hmm. Cancer, though, is a molecular disease. Long yeah. before it reaches two and a half centimeters, molecules have gone crazy. They've been mm -hmm. running around the body. They're present. We can find those molecules. We can use that to diagnose the cancer mm -hmm. long before it reaches that state. And that's my dream. And that's the singular motivation for my research over the last many years. It's mm -hmm. something that has made me run to work every day. <laughs> and we've made steady progress on it, too. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could just elaborate kind of on the basics of how, how cancer works in the body and then to the progress that you guys have made this recently. Okay, sure. I like, to, so, uh, I like to think of cancer as a uh, ship that's been hijacked by, pi by pirates. So normally your cells in your body are just going along great. They divide, they do, they do whatever they're supposed to do physiologically, and then they die at an appropriate time. In the case of cancer, though, the pirates have come on board, and they basically are flogging the captain until the cancer cell is producing more and more copies of itself, and then growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So cancer is a disease of molecules run amok that are hijacking the, the nucleus and mm -hmm. hijacking the machinery of the cell to make additional copies of itself. Now, of course, all those copies are not benign. You yeah. know, they start running around the body, they start interfering with other organs. Or, you know, in this case of some cancers, they, they're large enough to, to push out past the boundaries of the organ and start uh, breaking blood, you know, into blood vessels and places like, and uh, that's when that those, those types of events are what we associate with all the really bad aspects of cancer. Mm -hmm. And, and the progress, any progresses that you guys have made 
at the lab cool. recently. Cool. I'm so glad you asked. So we have a paper that's in press at Analytical Chemistry, mm -hmm. where together with Reg Petter, the electrochemist I mentioned earlier, yep. we've invented this way of detecting cancer biomarkers in urine in 60 seconds. Okay. So this is amazingly fast. Okay. Yeah. If you think about, say, a home pregnancy test, also exactly. a test in urine. Yeah. It's not 60 seconds, even though decades of optimization have been done on that. Yeah. So we have a fundamentally new process that gets us really fast results. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also super duper sensitive, so it can detect the molecules associated with cancer at relevant concentrations in urine, so at, con at the, the, the density that is necessary to make a diagnosis in, in mm -hmm. urine. So I'm really, really excited about this. This is a, a really big breakthrough for us. It's something mm -hmm. we've been working on for close to a decade and a half or so. And, um, That's congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And so what I really, my dream is that people get routinely checked for cancer just by a simple urine test. Yeah. And if we do that, then we can catch the cancer so much earlier. Yep. And it's so much more treatable when we catch it earlier. It's less painful for the patient. The physician looks more heroic. <laughs> uh, everyone wins. It, it's, yeah. it's awesome. You know, families are, are kept together, all those things. That would be... Yeah. That's my dream. That's what makes yeah. me want to work. I think because the sooner you can find it, the quicker you can treat it, the exactly. higher the survival rate. So Yes, exactly. And the less harsh the, the chemotherapy is, the less harsh the conditions are for treatment. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, how, how is this, like if you could just go into a little bit of detail in the most basic way possible, how this, this test works. Um, okay. With yeah, I'd love to. Okay, because I should mention that this is the same test that we're developing for COVID-19 antibodies mm -hmm. and we have a little bit of a twist on that mm -hmm. but general so just think about a pregnancy test okay so you have this thing you dip it in urine and then the urine kind of wicks up through uh, some sort of absorbent layer and what's happening is then you're looking for binding to these antibodies okay mm -hmm. so in this case the antibodies are providing your diagnostic ability but you have to wait for the molecules to bounce through the wicking layer it's very slow okay mm -hmm. in our case what we do is we we make a surface, so there's no wicking layer. So instead we have this surface and we have these viruses that are integrated into the surface. So these mm -hmm. viruses have a particular shape. That's why we're using them. We're, we're using these harmless viruses that have this long, skinny, tube-like shape. Okay. And so now the viruses can grab onto these molecules and when they do, it forces apart these little wires that, that are molecular in scale. These are like the world's tiniest things. You can't image them, they're really, really small. Anyway, so as it forces apart those wires, then that changes the conductance going through this uh, material. So anyway, what we've done is we've combined the waking device together with the material to get us the response just a lot faster. And so again, it's 60 seconds. And I suspect we could push that even further, but for now we're going to say 60 seconds just to be on the conservative yeah. side. And, and we reported that in a peer reviewed journal. So that's uh, a robust study. Yeah. And we also looked at a whole bunch of independently fabricated devices. I just need to get out of the, the science part of me, insist that we get this out of life. So we, we fabricated a whole bunch of devices independently. They all work the same. The yep. variance between each device was very, very low, to so very tight tolerances, even though these things aren't being manufactured. And when mm -hmm. we manufacture them, things are going to look even better. So that's, that's what we're up to. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thanks. And hopefully, you know, it goes to production and then, you know, we can help to save hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Oh, so. man, Rich, that's my dream. Yeah. That's exactly what I want. Yeah. And that's... That would be awesome. Oh, I probably also need to disclose something important. Mm -hmm. I co-founded a company called Phage Tech, which has licensed this device. And so I have a financial interest in mm -hmm. uh, the success of this as well. So I should mention that University of California at Irvine has reviewed, I have a plan in place to manage this conflict of interest and mm -hmm. UCI has reviewed that plan and approved it in accordance with its conflict of interest policy. Thank you for disclosing that. Um, thanks it's a good thanks for letting get this disclosure out of the way. Yeah, and it's a good transition also. So I was going to say, you not only are in academics, you also have helped to co-found two companies. So maybe you, could, you can talk a little bit about Phage Tech and kind of what, it, what its purpose is and what, what sure. it does. Love to. So those little viruses that I described as tubes, those are called phage because they, they're actually bacteriophage because they are viruses that only infect bacteria. 
So phage tech is all about using those bacteria phage in sensors and using these benign viruses that only affect bacteria and putting them to use for the good side for us. Anyway, so uh, phage tech is focused on bladder cancer diagnostics and cancer diagnostics in general, but they've licensed the technology from Reg and myself, and Reg and I are the co-founders of the company. Mm -hmm. And they're located in Irvine. They've recently hired a new CEO who I'm really excited to be working with. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really cool because they could address the very challenging next stage. You know, mm -hmm. so Rish, when, when I do something in my lab, it's, it's actually, it, it's, it's really fun. It's discovery mode. You know, yep. we'll go into lab, we'll, we'll zip apart stuff. I'll get a 3D printer involved. We'll, you know, do a bunch of stuff, but it, it's kind of strung together. You know, yeah. we'll take a, a fingernail polish and use that as an insulator over, over leads and things like that. But, you know, a company like Phage Tech can take those ideas and then reduce them to engineering. And so as a scientist, it's absolutely thrilling to watch that process of uh, taking science from the bench where it, everything is pretty crude and, you know, it's just like, just, you know, discover the new thing. Yeah. And then actually turning into something that you can basically have real confidence in going forward and that you can watch and turn into a business and sell and know that every time you sell one of those items, it'll be exactly the same. And that's mm -hmm. a really challenging problem, actually. And it's been really fun to watch and they've uh, made a huge amount of progress on it. That's great. That's great to hear that the progress is being made. And if you could just go into a little bit, any, any, th any products that you have put into production with, with the company that people would know? So the company is at an early stage and uh, they're uh, doing clinical testing at a scale that, uh, you know, is unimaginable to an academic researcher. It's just, you know, way bigger because you'd have to like make thousands of these devices and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And again, if we're making them on our little bench in at UCI, there's no way we're going to be able to make thousands. Yeah. So uh, the company is working on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they are starting clinical testing of one of their first bladder cancer sensors. I would say in like the next three to six months or so. Mm -hmm. And they don't have any products just yet, mm -hmm. but they have a, real, a really general platform that would allow them to make products in a whole bunch of areas. So product number one is gonna be bladder cancer. If they connect with a larger company that say needs a companion diagnostic for their clinical trial, Phage Tech can readily do that sort of thing and so mm -hmm. does. That's great, that's great. And yeah. Phage Tech is not the only company helped to co-found, uh, as we mentioned earlier. They also helped to co-found Debut Biotechnology. Maybe you could expect, expect, explain that a little bit and kind of what you guys specialize there. Sure, I'd love to. So Debut is a company located in San Diego, actually specifically La Jolla, and they're focused on continuous flow biosynthesis, which is this really fascinating area. So let's talk a little bit about how we make stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. So all the stuff that surrounds you, Rish, is made in really enormous, enormous quantities, right? So, yep. you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, someone's in there mixing the paint to do the, yep. right? These are made on you know, gargantuan scales. And generally speaking, they're made in these big vats. Okay, yeah. so that's a traditional way that chemical engineering works. Even pharmaceuticals are made in these giant, giant vats. Mm -hmm. And those types of processes are inefficient because the mixing through the vat isn't so great. The, the cost for waste is very high. You know, the sort of inefficiencies lead to waste. It takes a lot of energy to heat up all that stuff. So there's this area where instead of building stuff in vats, instead we make it in little pipes and we pipe through the starting materials. And as they go through these pipes, they're transformed into the products. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about the pipes is the mixing is perfect. The temperature control is amazing. And uh, specifically, we're using enzymes to do this. So debut licensed two technologies from my lab for attaching enzymes to surfaces and for accelerating enzymes. And it's using that to, uh, to do these things under really mild conditions in yeah. aqueous solution in, uh, with no harsh acids or bases and at room temperature with way, way less waste because enzymes, these are protein catalysts that are found in our bodies that are found yep. in plants. Those things are like the world's best chemists. They are amazing specificity of the products. There's less waste mm -hmm. there. So anyway, so debut is focused on making fine chemicals, making beers and uh, wines and other high value beverages. Mm -hmm. 
and doing it with in a greener, cleaner, more efficient manner. That, that's fantastic. I'm just curious, since you are making it in such, I guess, micro, micro doses, with the rise of what's come, uh, of over the next, I would say, 10 years or so of personal, more personalized medicine, this, I'm sure, ties quite well into that. Absolutely, Rish. And FDA is pushing us very hard. It's pushing the whole industry actually very hard to move into continuous flow because that will give us the flexibility that we need to respond to emergencies like this pandemic we're facing or to niche tailor things for one particular case or you know, a handful of people with very rare disease. And so I think that's one of the most exciting aspects of, of continuous flow biomanufacturing is the incredible flexibility. One thing I should say is you can also do this on monster scale, right? Mm -hmm. You can simply, you know, you can use really big pipes and you can pipe stuff through at yep. like, you know, very, very high flow rates. So I think it is competitive with batch synthesis. And in some ways it's even better. You can do things even faster, with yeah. less uh, energy needs and things like yeah. that. So, so that's, that's really exciting. Ability to scale up and scale down basis on the need. Yeah, and actually that's one of the challenges as well because all the mixing is there. Uh, continuous flow works exceptionally well at the scaling up. One of the challenges is when you go to bigger and bigger vats, the scaling becomes harder and harder because you run into all these weird problems about heat distribution and mixing and this and that and you know, just like getting stuff in and out of there at the same rates and stuff. But uh, in continuous flow, you're just scaling pipes, so it's a lot more scalable. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. So I'd just like to move on to the final questions. Uh, sure and go through it. So, you know, we go through each of our guests and we break down their habits, routines, rituals that they have. Um, so just curious if you could share kind of any habits or routines or rituals that you have in your your day-to-day -day life. Okay. Well, I have to tell you, I'm very, very habit-oriented and I have very uh, strictly held routines. The reason is I just don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the time I spend sleeping has to be very, very efficient. Yeah. So I spend, uh, so let's just start with sleep. I yep. a lot about sleep. I have a whole system worked out to ensure that my eight hours in bed is spent almost entirely sleeping. I don't want to mm -hmm. spend any time tossing and turning. Yep. So uh, for example, that means going to sleep at the same time every night. Before, an hour before sleep, all the screens in my house go off and I turn on music and I bring out the cats and we have uh, cat games. I need to laugh, mm -hmm. right? To, yeah. to, it cares the day. Anyway, so promptly at 9.30, the lights go out. I've, oh, right before going to sleep, I read a book, actual paper book with mm -hmm. uh, kind of an orange light that kind of lulls me a little bit, you know, starting to get the circadian rhythms into the sleep cycle. And then I, I hit the bed and I'm asleep in four, four, to, four to eight minutes. Wow. Oh, and I monitor all this stuff very closely. So mm -hmm. I'm asleep. I do things like during the day, I take most of my water intake early in the day, decreasing as the day wears on. So I'm not going to be waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom a bunch of times mm -hmm. because that also, right? Each day, yeah. you know, then I lose part of my eight hours, just refalling yeah. back to sleep. It drives me crazy. Anyway, so at the end of that, I also, I, we have a lot, we have a number of cats. I'm surprised they haven't appeared yet, but <laughs> they're around. So I have to do things like wear a face mask and earplugs to make sure that I'm not getting woken up. Anyway, so long story short, I'm up pretty early, 5 to 5.30. I have a clock that has light so that you kind of, I kind of gently uh, wakes me up. And I spend time in the morning, you know, chores, things like that. And then every single day I work out. So every other day I do cardio. And mm -hmm. lately this has been uh, riding like a hamster on a wheel in my garage uh, yep. on a stationary bicycle. And I race on Zwift, which is a lot of fun. It's one of these, it's like Peloton, but with my actual racing bike. So I'm, okay. I do that in the garage for an hour and a half. On the other days, I have, I, I do weight training, but I want to break things up because one of the challenges, you can get into these ruts and it starts to sound like I have a rut, right? When I have yeah. this very rigid schedule. So what I do is I use a random number generator to generate uh, a page number in this book that I have of workouts. And so every day, every other day when I'm doing these weight, weight training or whatever training, I do a random workout. And mm -hmm. I try to, it, so it lands on a page and I look on the page, usually it's like two or three workouts. I choose the one that's least similar to the one I did last time. Oh, wow. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, so I spend, so workout, let's say an hour, hour and a half or so. And 
very rigid again about food because uh, well, I have a very sedentary lifestyle, especially these days. Yes. So uh, very carefully monitoring calories. But you know, I like to have a breakfast that has some protein. Very uh, you know, very careful about that sort of thing. And then after that, it's just meetings, meetings, meetings. Yeah. And that's the good part of the day, right? I get I love. Yeah part of the day where I get to talk to all these great people at UCI, talk to my colleagues at other universities. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm uh, back home starting again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down. I think the audience can learn a lot from that, especially the sleep portion. Oh, sleep is one of my passions, Rish. I'm a competitive sleeper. <laughs> and what does, let's just move on to the next question. What does success mean to you? Okay, that's a great question. I have different, there, in my job as a professor, there are many different ways to measure success. The most important thing to me, the single reason why I'm a professor is success is the quality of my students and their success. That's one of the ways that I measure my own success yep. is just from watching how well they're doing out in the world and what kind of scientists are they? You know, and I'm so thrilled that the early students who graduate from my lab are out there now directing chemistry at their companies. They've started companies. They've done amazing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the unexpected perks of my job, actually, is to watch their success. <laughs> but I would say that's the A number one thing that I, I'm most concerned about is what is the quality of people who are graduating from my lab? And that includes both graduate students and undergraduates. I really want to see them be really effective thinkers and idea generators and creative individuals in their own right. Okay, so that's one aspect. The yep. other aspect is, is my science making an impact on society? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's, uh, it goes back to your question earlier. What are the products? You know, yeah. what has actually gotten out there? And I'll be honest, we're still at early days and I haven't yeah. hit that yet, but that's, what, that's the next marker of success, my next milestone. That's the next mm -hmm. thing that I really wanna do. That's what's driving me these days. Yeah or one of the things that's driving me these days. So that's, that's another aspect of success that I'm really passionate about. And, and then the other thing is I want to generate new knowledge. I want to, to find stuff that no one else has known and mm -hmm. put it out there and see how the world reflects on it and mm -hmm. what happens. So in academic terms, that means publishing papers. I live in a publisher parish world and that's fine. <laughs> I love that. I love writing. It's one of my passions. I love communicating. So uh, that happens. We, do, we spend a lot of time on that sort of thing. And other markers of success are a little more ephemeral. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy when I get good scores in sleep, for example. I know that's yep. been a, I look at uh, weekly totals. I look at 30 day moving averages for heart rates and weight just to gauge whether or not my workouts are working successfully. I care a lot about my own creativity and you know whether I'm having enough outlets for it. Uh, I like to build things. I like mm -hmm. to see that my projects are getting done. Yeah. I also want to see a certain number of proposals go out the door. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, challenges of running a lab like mine is that you constantly are trying to get more funding for it. So I want to see that. How much more time do we have to talk about Marker Success? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we can move to the next question. And, uh... yeah. <laughs> it's, I guess the short answer is there's no one Marker Success, right, Rish? Yeah. yeah. And, and every single day is a different thing that makes you happy. And I think ultimately that's really what your question is about. Like, what is yeah. it that makes you happy? What is it that makes you feel that you're moving the ball down the field? Yeah, to use a sports Absolutely. metaphor. Right? Yeah. And so Absolutely. Every single, every single day, we have to find one of those markers that we're making progress on to know that we've made it. Yeah. And that's, the, that's one of the reasons why it's such a long question to answer. Yeah, no, no it's, uh, you gave some great answers. So the next question, what does personal care mean to you? Okay, yeah, so obviously a passion, although you wouldn't know it from my lack of, of uh, haircut in the recent uh, times necessitated by this <laughs> weird COVID situation. But yeah. okay, so personal care is dedicating the time to yourself that you need to be successful. You know, <laughs> not just taking for granted that you're a machine and you could just, you know, simply water the machine, you know, some food, chow it down as quickly as possible, but also, you know, dedicating the time to, to treat yourself right. And also those who surround you right? Mm -hmm. Because they're part of your ecosystem, right? By taking care of the people around you and 
helping them achieve their goals and helping them you know, be happy and productive, that is part of personal care. So personal care for me is pretty expansive. I guess in a more specific context, it includes stuff like, you know, you know, the beard moisturizer that I use yeah. and things like that. But I think we really should be thinking about personal care in a much larger context of mm -hmm. each of us lives in, uh, not in a bubble, we live in an ecosystem and we need to think about tending to that ecosystem and thinking about all the elements that add to that ecosystem and trying to maximize those, mm -hmm. not simply to take them for granted, but actually think about, okay, so if I make a change over here, if I spend a little bit more time on this one aspect, how is that going to make this other aspect better? And how mm -hmm. is that going to help the, the whole? Thank you. I think that's a very complete and holistic answer to, to approach. And uh, so final question, if you were to have a dinner party, and you can invite three people dead or alive, who would you choose and why? Okay. I hate to do this, but they're going to be mostly scientists and one author. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so by the way, I was not expecting this question. Okay. So, <laughs> but it turns out it's one of those things I love to think about. So yeah. I would definitely love to have a dinner party for Marie Curie. Marie Curie Slodowska, uh, winner of two Nobel Prizes in science, only a human to ever do so. I am blown away by her drive and her uh, single-minded uh, focus and ability to really alter our world. Her science mm -hmm. was truly revolutionary. I would love to sit down and just uh, pick her brain and yeah. talk to her about my projects and see what she thought. And at the same time, learn what was making her uh, run to work every day. Along those lines, I'd love to have uh, a dinner with Richard Feynman, just because he's such a quote unquote curious character. Yep. He is one of science's great, fascinating individuals. And mm -hmm. I would just love to uh, spend some time with him, uh, mm -hmm. hearing his ideas and just, you know, reminiscing with him. Mm -hmm. I loved his books when I was a little kid and I'd love to, uh, to talk to him some more. Now I should acknowledge there are some aspects of Richard Feynman's character that I find repugnant these days. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that when I was a little kid, but I do now. Yeah. You know, he had some aspects that uh, do not look good in a modern light, let's just say. Yeah. All right. And then finally, I would like to have, I'd like to invite Patrick O'Brien to mm -hmm. dinner because uh, he wrote my all time favorite series of books. He wrote these 20, 20.5 books about two individuals, Dr. Stephen Matherin and uh, Captain. Aubrey sailing around the world and going on adventures during the Napoleonic War era. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Matterin would jump off the ship at every uh, port of call and find all kinds of interesting natural uh, phenomena and bring them back on board. And uh, I just, the research that he brought to bear on these characters just has me absolutely fascinated. So I would definitely want to have dinner with, with uh, him because I'd like to just talk to him some more. Now I understand, I've read, I've read his biography. I've spent some time talk, thinking about him. I understand he wasn't such a nice individual per se. Uh, mm -hmm. I would expect that uh, to be kind of less banter and more, uh, you know, getting kind of slapped back and told to mind my own business and things <laughs> like that. But I would still love to uh, talk to the guy who invented my two fam favorite characters from literature. Okay, now how many people can we have at this dinner, Rish? Uh, it's three, so it's capped at the All third. Right. All right, <laughs> let's stop there. But All honestly, right. I would love to have triple that number. And oh man, that would be a dinner party to remember. Yeah. I definitely make the drinks. I, I make these tiki drinks. And I would also insist on making all the food down to the bread. I love making uh, sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. I can I have the menu all picked out. So uh, <laughs> when can we have this happen? Yeah, <laughs> try our best to make it happen for you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to, if the audience wanted to connect with you or see any progress that happens with the lab, where should they connect or, and look for further, for their information? Okay, great question. GWeisslab.net is a lab's website. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's something short, I'd be happy to address it. Mm -hmm. They could just send me an email, gweiss at uci.edu. Truthfully, though, I'm super, super busy, and it's very unlikely I'm going to answer your, say, personal care questions or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But, you know, if it's a science thing, I'd love to, to try to help out. It's, I don't mind answering and communicating to the world anything about our science that I can help with. So. 
That's, that's terrific. So this has been a great conversation. I think the audience learned a t tremendous amount. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, it's a real pleasure, Rish. And thanks a lot for this great podcast you put together. It's really enjoyed uh, listening to your other episodes. And Thank you. as a uh, huge po podcast fan, this was a real thrill for me to be on one as well. All right. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Likewise. Bye.